All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, let's go ahead and get started. About uh, 8.38, don't want to keep you here all night. So I hope everyone sincerely is having a lovely Thursday evening, just coming into Friday, towards the end of the week. So let's go ahead and get started. We'll just get started, just a nice little review of the uh, ground rules. Digi Alex, I was waiting. I was waiting for someone. To, I, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I, knew it. <laughs> I was like, you know what? I'm at least going to get one person messaging me asking about that. That's fine. I will, uh, as soon as we're done here, I'll take care of it. All righty. So... As you can tell from the ambiance here, that I am clearly sitting in front of a fire, where my uh, my where my uh, my uh, computer desktop is a fire, as you can see. So let's go ahead and uh, yeah, we all do need a break. I feel that snowy owl. One day away, one day away, and then uh, then it's effectively downhill from there, right? I got you. I feel you. All right, so what we're going to do today, ladies and gentlemen, is if, uh, if you are one of my students and or someone who attends the same institution I teach at, we're going to look at uh, Unit 4, which corresponds to roughly chapters 22 through 25 in our textbook. So if you're not, but you're a student in uh, AP World, then this is Unit 4. We call this Unit 4, or the uh, Maritime Empires. Mighty Man 14386, so good to meet you. Thanks so much for dropping by. Let's see, Sisu Soup. What a nice, uh, what a nice uh, username. All nighters, eh? It's all good. Okay. So here's the plan for today. Just for those who, uh, for those who uh, need to know, we're just gonna kind of do the same thing we've been doing the last couple nights. Uh, we're just gonna go over some unit content. We're gonna. We could either, if there's time, we'll either look at some multiple choice questions, or we may do some more image analysis. Um, it just depends on what the people want. We'll, we'll take we'll take a little vote at the time. Uh, but for now, we're just going to go ahead and uh, just kind of do that quick content review. So we're going to go ahead and get started with a uh, quick overview of the map here, ladies and gentlemen. I think it might not be a bad idea to look at this map really quickly, just because it's kind of an important map. So I'm going to quickly adjust the size there. So the places that we're talking about Shogun time, well, we are going to mention the Shogun once, but we kind of mentioned the Shogun last time, right? So... We got this here map, right? And we zoom in, right? Where are the big transatlantic empires, right? So you have this nice bright shade of green, which is the Spanish empire, uh, which kind of, as you can see, s comes down the spine of South America. Uh, although it doesn't actually go all the way to Tierra del Fuego. That's kind of a, a, a misnomer. This area was actually uh, unclaimed by most major powers before the 1800s. So, and then, so that's Spain, mainly here in South America, parts of Florida, Cuba, what's now called the Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico. But Spain also had uh, one very particular important possession on the other side of the world, and that is the Philippines, the Philippines. Spain was the only power that actually had like what we consider a large colony uh, in Asia at the time. Everything else was pretty much just little trading ports. Uh, the Dutch, for example, this is the East India Company, not necessarily the Dutch Republic itself, but even then this is kind of a small spread out group of islands. And the Portuguese are over here in what is now uh, India, a little port of Goa, uh, along with a couple of other forts down the coast here. So, you know, this is mostly the, uh, the uh, you know, uh, maritime empires, right? We call them maritime empires. The Portuguese also have a couple of... Uh, little colonies here on the west coast of uh, Central Africa, uh, as well as Brazil. This is Portugal's main colony right here, Brazil. And then you got the English over here with their 13 colonies. That's us in the future. Uh, and you can't see it here, but the uh, English also were here at the Hudson Bay colony, uh, which is kind of just around this area called the Hudson Bay. Uh, and then you got the French in French Canada, right? And the Mississippi. And this map is, uh, it looks pretty sparse. That's only because it only showed places where there was large scale settlement. Right, as well as what will become really important later on, although it may not be as important right now, would be uh, the island of uh, the colony of San Domingue, also known as Haiti. Haiti. So that'll all become more important in the next unit. But for now, we're going to go ahead and switch gears really quick. And we're going to swap our screen here to get to our quiz for the day. Here, let's see. Where'd you go? Hmm. 
move this. Oops, that's weird. Hmm, it's odd. I guess I need to move. Hang on, let me just swap that over. That's odd. That wasn't working. And now it's tiny. All right. Hmm. Nope, that's not it. That's not it. Ah, oh, here we go. Got it. There we go. That's better. Okay. Sorry for that. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and let's just dive into it. We'll take about four minutes. And while we get everybody sort of squared away, everyone who's here gets the, uh, we get the prompt attendance uh, raffle. So we're going to go ahead and start to start this this round's particular sticker raffle the prompt attendance sticker raffle so for those who are here early congratulations get to get to early early shot in there we'll do a couple raffles as we do every game while we wait for uh we'll wait for at least something around the uh something like 10 people we just need a couple to make sure we have at least a decent amount going here before we get moving So you want to hear something funny while we wait, and uh, if you don't win, it's rigged. Yeah, no, totally. Um, you want to hear something funny while we get everybody uh, logged in here. So two nights ago, or actually last Friday, right after we did our pub, I did my PUBG stream, I went and helped my um, the person I live with who wanted to hang some lights in the backyard. Um, I went and helped them put a hook in a tree so they could hang the lights from the tree and run them across the yard to another tree, um, which went pretty well pretty easy but and here's the catch our neighbor is not super happy about it and the whole reason we did that was because the lights were too close to that neighbor's fence um and so we do this we take the lights down from the fence bring them over to the tree run them back across the yard the other way and wouldn't you know it what does the neighbor do almost the very next day is he is he he sends a text message to the to my roommate and says like um yes would you please move the lights you moved some of them you didn't move enough of them uh i can still see the lights uh and they are they are very bright in my window and the funny thing was he sent a photo of the lights and yes you see some of the lights in the photo but you know what you also see <laughs> you see the upstairs window with the light on like the upstairs window like bright as heck where my roommate's room is <laughs> it's just like well what what you're gonna get mad about the room the light from the room I don't know what you want, man. <laughs> what do you want? Um, so, uh, yeah, it's... I'm not really sure what the deal is. Like, I could understand it the first time because the lights went right up to the fence and you could see them from the living room. So I do kind of... I understood it that time. Like, I got it at that time. But this time I don't really understand. So, I don't know. But, uh, the, no, this is even the better part. The very next day after we'd strung those lights over, the very next day... Um, we the next morning we came out and they had fallen off the tree somehow they had come off the hook and just fallen on the ground and the first thing we thought was yo did the neighbor sneak over at night and take the lights down <laughs> this really old dude did he sneak over at night he's not actually that old but this uh this dad uh did he sneak over at night and uh take the lights down don't know don't think so we got him back up pretty quick we'll see if they stay up though fallen amen cool all right well we're gonna go ahead and get started we got about seven players um and more people can always join the uh, the code will be displayed at the bottom but we're gonna go ahead and get started just because uh don't want to keep everybody here all night but yeah we're gonna go over some unit four stuff let's go let's go all righty so the age of exploration which some scholars also call the age of contact isn't associated with which individuals what individuals historically are associated with the age of exploration there are several here not just one favorite book that's hard to say there's a lot of really good books out there um i had to pick one favorite book of all time it's really hard i could give you like my favorite book of this year i could give you that that's pretty easy but all time that would be hard. that would be really hard favorite book of all time i guess if i had to snowy i'll give you a favorite book of all time 
I'd probably have to say Oscar Wilde's Dorian Gray, a portrait of Dorian Gray. I really like that book. Uh, the 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 uh, satire uh, and the biting sarcasm of it. Teenage me just love that. Also, the questions of morality, stuff like that. Awesome. Yes. So, of all these explorers, right? Vasco da Gama and Christopher Columbus are the ones we most associate with the age of exploration. Columbus, of course, sailing the ocean blue in 1492 and Vasco da Gama reaching India in, I believe, 1488. So, all right. Let's go next question. Whoops. All righty. So, what navigational tool came to Europe from the Islamic world. It's also pictured there, if you know what it looks like. In fact, in fact, hang on one second. Am I excited for break? Of course, even adults get excited for break. Nice, we got the astrolabe. And if you've ever wondered what an astrolabe looks like, if you ever want to see one in person, I do happen to have a replica, non-functioning, of course. But this is sort of what they look like up close. These are all the parts of the astrolabe, right? Each of these points being a star, this being the visible night sky, this rule being used to calculate the angle of the star that you're looking at, and essentially, you would have the visible universe in front of you in the palm of your hand. It's quite amazing. Yes. Well, I do have a few interesting things. It's, of course, it's non-functioning, so it won't, you know, it wouldn't actually tell me where I am. Old school astrolabes would actually be able to tell you where you are within a certain latitude, but this one's non-functioning, and it's in Arabic, and I can't read Arabic. That's kind of an issue. However, what I wanted to show you was a very short video of a guy who actually can show you how an astrolabe works. Um, I wanted to pop over uh, a short little video from the British Museum. A uh, little video from the British Museum. Let's see. Oh, that didn't work. Here we go. The Curator's Corner. This guy works for the British Museum, and he's going to really quickly show us the parts of and how you might use an astrolabe so that we can much better appreciate this. Uh, this is only about to be a short one-minute clip. Can't use the whole thing because I almost got copyright struck last time for that uh, Jodo Akbar clip. So let's just give a listen. He's going to just quickly break down the parts of an astrolabe and how one might use it. Explains all of the parts of it, and for each of them, it's very important to keep a clear. So to begin with, this is the ring, this is Halfa, which is connected to the Kusi, which in European standards is called a triumph in English. So why is there a ring on top? Well, this is to hang it from, so you have it even and you can hang it at eye level, so it's always flat. This is always at eye level. It's not shouldn't be swinging about. If you hold it in your hand, you're not necessarily holding it flat. This bit around the edge, this is the um, this is the mother, um, the mother in Latin, and this holds everything together. And it has information, so it has um, the zodiac on the outside. It has zodiacs, of time, of days. It has all kinds of information. Inside, there are plates, and they're held inside the the um, the mother. So you can have sometimes up to about five. They're often engraved on both sides. So depending on how far north or south you are, you'd use a different plate. So you'd have maybe one for Mecca, you'd have maybe one for Cairo, you'd have maybe one for Cordoba. Um, and you can change them. On the front here, this bit with the star pointers, um, this is known in Latin as the Riti, which is the net. But in Arabic, it's the Ankabut, which means the spider. And this is your map of the stars. Each one of these points to a different star. Uh, and all of this is held in suspension by this. This is the pin, the pharos. And then finally, on the back, you have the alidada. So this is the ruler. This is what you use to sight with. Now, you have to be quite the expert to know how it works exactly, but I can give you a generally good idea. He's so going to show us how it works now. What you want to do first, if you want to tell the time, is you need to use this. This is the Aldada. You have to imagine that this is hanging straight. I won't hold it too much like that. And you would line this up with the sun, as such. Imagine the sun is over there somewhere. Obviously, you wouldn't look through it to sight the sun, because you'd go blind. Everyone knows that's a bad idea. But you put your palm there, and you'd make sure that the sun was shining directly through it. And then this would point you to a particular date, a particular time, you'd actually use the zodiac to tell you uh, what day or time it is. So when we talk about like the zodiac, you know, like in uh, zodiac as it relates to like the horoscope stuff, that's why the zodiac was important historically speaking because that's uh, it had a lot of associations with astronomy. 
right? So people tend to poo-poo astrology, and it is kind of it's it's sort of uh, acquired a less than reputable reputation um, in our community. It's just because uh, it is a uh, well, it's 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 sort of acquired sort of a how can I put it a toy-ish reputation, if you will, right? Not being something serious, but something silly. And I think, you know, to an extent that's deserved, but also we also should recognize that astrology was one of the first steps toward, more importantly, astronomy. And tools like the Astrolabe reflect that. All right, next question. New ships. Yeah, drop that Zodiac. Nah, I don't honestly even remember. My wife remembers. She's always telling me. She's always making these mentions about the compatibility of our star signs or whenever her mother acts in a certain way she's like well mom is just a, a a libra or whatever her mom's star sign is i don't know well mom's just a libra you know she just she's like that because she's a libra and i'm just like oh geez save me save me <laughs> nah i don't get my birthday out that easy cool oh Really? Except we didn't get the except. Oh, ouch! Yeah, the galley's like ancient. Every like most ancient civs had a galley. All these other ones are uh, all these other ship designs: the Carvel, the Karak, the Flicht. These are uh, newly built in the age of exploration, right? Using the latine sail and uh, sealed holes. <laughs> My birthday is. Uh, I'm a springtime child. We'll put it that way. I'm a springtime child. Awesome. So, Prince Henry of Portugal, Henry with an I, sponsored on voyages of exploration for all of the following reasons, except what? What did he not lead voyages of exploration to do? <laughs> November boy? Nah. Nah, 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 nah. I know November boy. I'm an island boy. Island boy. Island boy. <laughs> Yeah, I saw that too. I'm trying. I actually legitimately don't know which island they're talking about, but uh, they're funny. Awesome. Yes, Henry the Navigator was definitely about finding a, a route to a profitable West Africa, outflanking his uh, uh, rivals in Morocco, and not abolishing the slave trade, but in fact doing more slave trading. Some, some contemporary scholars and commentators have actually called him Prince Henry the Slaver. Some people even said he single-handedly began the transatlantic slave trade. Now, I don't know about that. That seems a bit extreme. But he did buy slaves from West Africa and transport them to uh, the Atlantic islands off the coast of Portugal. So, I mean, maybe. You, you might be able to make that argument. Born in May? Eh, maybe. Ha, ha, ha. Cool. So, the transfer across continents of biological material and humans after the year 1500 is referred to as the what? I hope we all get this one. I hope we all get this one. I'm going to be seriously sad if we all don't get this one. Hot, cold. No, I'm not giving you guys my birthday. That's not how that works. May the 4th be with you. That is, I do like that day, but that's not because it's my birthday. May the 4th be with you. Dope. All right, what do we call this? Moving people around and biological materials around after the year 1500. Yes. Oh, thank goodness. Columbian Exchange. We got it. We got him. We got it. Dope. Dig it. All righty. What's next? An example of how the Columbian Exchange affects societies, and boy oh boy, we also better get this one right, I sincerely hope, is an example of all the following except. We're doing an except question again. Which one of these is not the case? Changing of society. All these are examples. Except. What do we call it? Except what? What? All right, what do we got? Come on, Dolly. Tell me we got it. Tell me we got it. Oh, oh darn. Well, yeah. So all of these are an instance where a society has been shifted in some way, shape, or form thanks to something that moved during the Columbian Exchange. But the movement of people and just settling a new place, that isn't necessarily like an existing society being transformed, right? So the potato was obviously a huge one. 
um, shifting gender roles in Africa due to in parts of West Africa due to a large drop in the male population, right? As well as the fact that Native Americans in what is now the Great Plains uh, began to use horses because they had not previously had horses. That was a fundamental shift to their way of life. Doop, doop, doop. All righty. Let's keep on moving. May the fourth be with you. That's such a good, I like that day. Cool. Where was there no Spanish empire? I feel like we got to get this one too. I'm going to be real sad if we uh, can't get this one. Where was there no Spanish empire? Come on, come on. No Imperia de España. Who time's up. What do we got? Oh, yes. Oh, thank goodness. Haiti. Haiti. Yes, that's the French colony. Technically, I should have called it by its colonial name, but I figured if I was using contemporary state names, I'd just go with it. We smart. Yeah. All right. Speaking of smart people, uh, speaking of smart people, let's, uh, let's, let's uh let's pick a winner oh such a small number of people entered though let's pick a winner all right snowy owl congratulations congratulations awesome i'm gonna reopen the entries that way if people want to uh enter they can let's go all right next question next question let's keep it moving more you shall collect yes just don't forget to ask me for them tomorrow all righty Cool. Which of the following trade goods was the primary catalyst for the age of exploration? Right? What really kicked it all off? What really kicked it all off? Arguably, it was a lot of things. Started learning Punjabi. That is amazing. Uh, is Namaste still here to say hello, or is there a different way to say hello in Punjabi? All right, let's see what we got here. Oh, for reals? Oh, all of these things, of course, were, were like eventually demanded uh, as part of the trade. It's Namaste Boy. What the, I mean, I don't know. Namaste is a lot of the other northern, northern, and northern, uh, northern Aryan languages. So I don't know. How do you say it, though, then? Or how would you pronounce it phonetically? Yeah, nutmeg and pepper. Nutmeg and pepper, that thing you find in your uh, spice cabinet, those are the main things that uh, sort of kicked off the uh, spi the uh, age of exploration, right? It was the desire. In particular, pepper. In particular, pepper. But nutmeg also on the side. <sighs> yeah, I mean, salt is important, but salt was never, like, in short supply or immensely profitable. But pepper, that was immensely profitable. How profitable, you might ask? Well, I'm so glad you did ask. Because we're going to find out exactly how profitable uh, pepper was. We're going to find out exactly how profitable it was by checking out. Oops, nope. Uh, there we go. Here we go. All right. Yeah, oh, there were many wars over the spice trade. Especially like between the English and the Dutch in the Banda Islands in Indonesia. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. There were some Dutch people there who did some war crimes against some English traders and the natives. Right? Let's find out exactly how much you could make trading spices. We're going to watch about it. Just two minute clip. Two minute clip. European traders went east with X, Y, and Z and brought back silks, gold, gemstones, and the most lucrative commodity of all spice. Today, nearly every kitchen pantry in the Western world contains spices such as cinnamon, nutmeg, and pepper. But in the 16th century, these spices were extremely expensive luxuries, and those who controlled the trade in spice became exceedingly wealthy. Middle Eastern traders bought spice cheaply in the East and sold it to European traders for many times more. Then, in turn, those European traders sold it to their customers for many times more again. This trade was strictly controlled, and the amount of markup that each link in the chain added to the goods as they made their way to customers in Europe were closely guarded secrets. When early European traders finally discovered what the prices were on the other side of the world at the source, 
they were flabbergasted. In India during the 15th century, the local price of pepper was three ducats per quintal. A ducat was a gold coin that weighed about an ounce and was the dominant currency at that time. A quintal was a unit of weight that was approximately 125 pounds. In today's currency, that would be like buying 125 pounds of pepper in Calcutta for $4,000 and then selling it in Venice for $120,000. That is a lot of money. That's a markup of over 3,200%. Trade in nutmeg was even more lucrative. One quintal of nutmeg purchased for the same $4,000 would sell for an astonishing $2.1 million in London or Paris. Today, if you look at the same amount of cocaine, one quintal, 125 pounds, you would pay about 125,000 for it at the source and could sell it wholesale in New York for $1.7 million. While this is a staggering profit, it is only a markup of about 1,300%. That is three times less profit than a typical nutmeg dealer in the 15th century. Yo, you got, you got, you, you, you got, you got, you got some of that nutmeg? Got any more of that nutmeg, man? Got, got, got some more of that nutmeg. Spice was the drug of choice during the Middle Ages. With that much potential for profit, it is easy to understand why the spice sources were so jealously guarded and why those in control of the spice trade wanted to stay in control at any cost. So that's, that's the thing. So just in case you were wondering, you know, drug dealers? No, nah, no, nah, spice dealers. If you ever wonder why the Dune series talks about spice instead of some other resource, that's... That's, uh, there's, I, I would be very surprised if there wasn't at least a little bit of inspiration there. I don't know for sure, but I suspect heavily there had to be some sort of, probably some inspiration there. Have mercy on our exams. Nah. Not about mercy. It's all about being prepared. All about being prepared. Why didn't they grow spices? That's a great question. That's a great question. And the answer is, uh, as David Child points out, uh, yeah, it does have a little bit to do with the environment, right? In particular, the environment, the, the geography of the, uh, the geography of Europe was not conducive to spice growing, and so therefore, in order to the attack, in order to get their hands on them spices, they had to go out and acquire territory where spices could be grown. <laughs> random, random dude tweaking off nutmeg. Yeah, that would be uh, that'd be most unfortunate. That'd be most unfortunate. Just like selling nutmeg cookies out of a bathroom stall. Yo, alrighty, so. Free or unfree, free or, sorry, unfree or coerced labor systems that were unique, keyword unique, to the Spanish Empire and the Americas. Check all that apply. Check all that apply. We're talking labor systems, unique or uh, to the Spanish Empire. We've got indentured servitude, the Mita slavery, and the encomienda slash departamento. Spice tea category, yeah. No, that's also, that's... That's the joke a lot of teachers started making where they just had a picture of uh, Ice-T, the, the rapper, with some with a thing of pepper in his hand. Oh, yeah. The, oh, definitely not. Well, I mean, drug, you know, at least it's <clears throat> below the, below the, under the table drug use is almost never sanitary. They were very dangerous. Dope. Yeah, we got the Mita, and then we have the Encomienda, right? The Mita and the Encomienda. At least, uh, it seems like some of us got that. Yeah. Dope, dope, dope. Cookies in the bathroom. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just trying to make an analogy here. Dope. All righty. Let's keep it moving. Next question. Let's go. So, which of the following most accurately describes native settler relations in European colonies? This one's a bit of a long one. You can take a second and read it. But essentially, the question is, who, uh, who is the one doing the, which, which European empires are doing the segregating, which empires were not doing the segregating, for lack of a better word, in a very broad, very general terms. Who's got the juice? Who's got the juice? Who's got the juice? Let's go. All right. Oh, man. That hurts. Yeah. Okay, so the question is about who is doing the strict segregating versus who is not, right? So the thing is, in the French colonies and the Spanish colonies, there was uh, 
a large degree of intermingling, if you will. Now, of course, it, it's, it's really important to keep in mind that just because there were lots of uh, like Europeans marrying natives, this did not mean everybody was equal, holding hands, singing Kumbaya. There was still very much a hierarchy, and this was still very much based on violence in many ways, but culturally, it just meant that there was a little more interaction between uh, Europeans, settlers, um, Africans who were mostly there as slaves, and Native Americans. So that just meant that there was a greater deal of uh, cultural interaction. Did not necessarily mean everybody was equal. We should be very clear to not to not make the mistake of thinking that everyone was equal because uh, they just happened to do a little bit of cultural interacting. So, dope, dope, dope. Okay, all right. Oh, David Child, thank you so much for the follow. I appreciate it. All right, next question. Let's go. So, compared to the Americas, so compared to the Americas, Portuguese, Dutch, and English colonies in Asia were what? Were what? This is a close reading here, close reading on this one. I feel like some people kind of jump to some conclusions, but I want to make sure we do a little close reading. Were they joint stock companies? Were they trading centers on the edge of empires? Or were they large-scale conquests by European armies? What were they? Oh, we got a fourth person in there. Dope. Ooh. Middle Prolly? Yeah. Oh. See, I knew people were going to jump at that. I knew people were going to jump at that. So the question of why it's not this one, joint stock companies, that's because the Portuguese, to a much lesser extent, didn't really do the joint stock company thing. That was mostly Dutch and English. Now, there actually was a Portuguese joint stock company. It was called like the Casa de India, the House of India. But uh, it was heavily controlled by the crown, right? Did not have nearly as much autonomy as the Dutch or the English did. So uh, if we're talking just Dutch or English, that would be joint stock companies. But in this case, what's important to, to know is, uh, catch you later, Snowy Owl. Glad you, could, uh, glad you could make it by. It's important to know that uh, in, in Asia, because there were already these big established states, you couldn't exactly have uh, giant conquests going on because you had these big empires, right? You know, the Portuguese got the little port city of Macau, but they weren't going to topple the Ming Dynasty. They didn't have the manpower or the ability to do that. So, yeah. Coolio. All right, next question. So, the transatlantic slave trade was made possible by all the following except, so which of these is not a reason for the large shipment of human beings across the Atlantic? All of these are true, but one of them is more, one of them is much less true before the year 1700. Let's see what we got. I think we only have two people playing right now, so I think in order to save us some time, we, uh, I think in order to save us some time, we're going to have to uh, boot some people just because it looks like only two people are playing. Aya Sutiasa. Aya I sued the Asada? I don't know. Yeah, oof. No, there were. So that's the thing to keep in mind, right? Is that there was a, a pre existing system of like slavery in Africa. Very different, a very different experience from uh, slavery in the Americas, but it was there, it did exist, right? And it's actually this last one because. After 1700, like a lot of the rules regarding the slave trade would be lifted. And so slavers just went buck wild. And the slave trade actually ticks up incredibly high after the year 1700. Even though it had been going on for like 300 years at that point, effectively, uh, there's just a huge spike after 1700 because uh, England and France and Spain, to a lesser extent, all just sort of lift their regulations. And it's like, yeah, do whatever you want. And then the, the, the slavers just go nuts. Uh, but yeah, like the ability to ship uh, the existing markets where they could just go and buy, you know, prisoners of war or debtors, uh, as well as the high demand for labor. These are all things that mean the transatlantic slave trade was possible or in demand. Coolio. All right. Let's go. We're about halfway there. We should pick another winner. We should pick another winner. What is a good way to remember what a cash crop is? What's a good way to remember a cash crop? I certainly hope we get this one. Right? How do you know when you see that question about the cash crops? How do you know what it is? How do you know? All right, we're gonna 
whoops. Yeah, we're gonna have to do that just because some people, I think are AFK. It's all good. Yeah, plants that are not necessary to sustain life, right? That's free, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's true. Like you don't need cash crops to sustain life. So when you, if you ever are confronted with that kind of questions like, well, coffee's nice and I drink it every day, but uh, I don't need it to live. I might even be a little healthier if I didn't drink it. Just, just maybe a little bit. Cools. All right, let's go. Next question. So, which of the following is not a cash crop? Let's think about it like this. Let's now put this to the test. Which of these is not a cash crop? And we'll give it about 10 seconds, and then we're going to go ahead and just cash the time in case anybody comes back. Is it coffee? Is it sugar? Is it cotton? Is it rice? Is it indigo? Which of these is not a cash crop? Which of these is not a cash crop? Dope, yeah, yeah, it's rice. Amen to that. Rice, yeah, no, it is rice, exactly, right? Because you you could eat rice, and it could be the basis of your your diet, right? But you can't really eat indigo. Uh, yeah, that is true, Kesu. The the thing about purple is that uh, it's very hard to get purple historically to make that color. So I don't show up on a lot of flags. Awesome. All right, let's go. There's actually a um, it was made sometimes by snails. Um, but it was also uh, occasionally made by blending various blues and reds together. And sometimes it was made up by crushing blue beetles and crushing red beetles together to make a beautiful purple hue. For a beautiful purple hue. Alrighty, so, um, which reminds me, I'll have to tell you guys the story of cochineal sometime. Gigantic uh, red bug that grows on a cactus, that lives on cacti, and you just grind them up into paste. And uh, it's what allowed the Aztecs to have such beautiful textiles. Dominica? The Dominican Republic has purple on its flag? I didn't even know that. I thought it was just blue and red, didn't they? Or do they have purple too? Interesting. Yes, all right, we got it. Silver, right? This is the map of the silver trade. But yeah, silver, first globally traded commodity. Yeah, correct, Amundo. All right, let's go. Let's keep it going. Oh, wait, we got to pick a winner. That's right. I need to pick a winner. I need to pick a winner. In the meantime, tell me about two consequences of the slave trade. All right, let's complete. And let's pick a winner. Who's it going to be? Who's it going to be? It's going to be. It's going to be. Oh, dig a child. Congratulations. Nope. All righty. So, consequences of the Atlantic slave trade include the following. Oh, how many more seconds do we got? Oh, we got a couple more seconds. So I thought we were done. Yeah, so just uh, reach out to me via stream or via Twitch, or uh, if not, you can feel free to reach out to me IRL if you uh, go to my institution. Sure, Rajdeep, uh, Raghudeep, sorry, Raghudeep. Yes, so the formation of the Maroons, right? And then what's also called call and response, which would uh, also be known as jazz, a big part of jazz, right? So, of course, the Maroon societies, which are groups of runaway slaves who escape from their masters and form societies in the mountains. Uh, the most famous of which, probably the most famous of which for world history, uh, would be the Windward Maroons of Jamaica, who waged several wars against the British uh, authorities in an attempt to uh, assert their autonomy. Uh, so popular were they? Oh, that's right. Hang on, Raghu Deep. Oh, that's right. I have links. Um, sorry, I have links blocked. My bad. Um, let me tell you what's. Uh, why don't you email it to me, and I will. Uh, I'll plug it. My bad. I, I keep links uh, turned off. Anyways, sorry. Where were we? Um, so let's talk a little bit about the. Uh, the Maroons, really quick. So Queen Nani, who you see in this picture here, is the most famous of the Maroons. And we're going to watch a really quick uh, clip about her life and her uh, exploits as the Queen of the Maroons that fought against uh, the British. 
So we're going to have a quick look at this. This is a great video. I believe these, um, this is a YouTube channel that does stories about um, Jamaican culture. So we're going to get a little lesson. We're going to learn something about the Maroons. Let's see. Yip, yip, yip. All right. Queen Nani of the Maroons. Right. Now, Maroon comes from the fact that the Spanish called them uh, Maros, uh, and so then English took the word Maroon. It has nothing to do with the color. Some people think it's got something to do with the color. Nothing to do with the color. All right, Queen Nanny, let's learn a little bit. The right excellent Nanny of the Maroons is Jamaica's only heroine, and perhaps Portland's most infamous native. She's an iconic figure in Jamaican history, and her legacy has been celebrated in poems, portraits, and currency. Much of Nanny's early life is unknown, including her birthplace. What is certain, however, is that she, along with other enslaved people, sought refuge from a brutal slave society in the Blue and Junkrow Mountains. So it's not known exactly where Nani came from, but it's believed that she was probably a Khan, which is a, a, a cultural group on the coast of West Africa that were one of the most uh, militant and um, uh, militant societies in West Africa, along with the Igbo. Uh, these are two of the most militant groups in West Africa. So she probably came from a very long um, military uh, tradition. She might have even been like the daughter of a warrior, possibly. Where together, they established a Maroon community. It is often cited that under British rule, the Maroons were perhaps the first set of people to settle in Portland, and that it was this settlement, coupled with Portland's unfavorable climate, which deterred white settlement here. But who exactly were the Maroons? And how did Nani become their most powerful leader. During the 15 to 1600s, enslaved Africans brought to Jamaica by the Spanish escaped into the Blue and Jungle Mountains, taking refuge with the Tainos, who had sacred sites deep in the interior of the island. The enslaved Africans were called Cimarroons by the Spanish, a term the English would later translate to Maroons. By 1640, the Maroons had established settlements in the east of the island. This group consists. That's, by the way, that's a, I believe that's a voodoo ceremony uh, being depicted here, but I could be mistaken. I'm pretty sure it's a voodoo ceremony. Of 600 women and children and 300 men were known as the Windward Maroons. In 1655, when Britain captured Jamaica from Spain, it instituted a system of slavery that was so harsh that it resulted in a mass exodus of enslaved people who fled to the mountains increasing the size of the Maroon settlement. The capital of the settlement became known as the Great Negro Town, and later, Nanitown. The English insistence on settling these lands led to the outbreak of the Great Maroon War. Fun fact, this picture that they're showing here, this is actually the Ashanti War in West Africa, which I suppose, in a certain way, it is a transatlantic appropriate photo, but this is, this is definitely not, uh, this is not Jamaica they're showing in this picture. Beginning in 1725. It was during the height of the Great War, 1728 to 1734, that the Maroons, under the leadership of Nani, and using their superior knowledge of the mountains, waged a successful guerrilla war against the British. The British. And so this is the uh, this is the peace treaty that they eventually had to sign with the Wind Maroons. What's Really interesting about them is that technically, if I'm remembering the story correctly, the British were like, okay, fine. We can't beat you because you know the terrain too well, right? But we'll make peace with you. But you have to promise, 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 that you will not take in any more runaway slaves. If a slave runs away to you, you have to send them back, which to my understanding, they may or may not have done on a regular basis. Um, scholars seem to be somewhat divided as to whether they sort of kept to the bargain and they might have just continued to accept runaway slaves into their ranks. But the thing about the Maroons is that they represented a great challenge to uh, imperial authority, or just not even imperial authority, just the center, centralizing power of the state, right? People saying, I don't want to live quite the way you are forcing me to live. So that's why Maroons are really important. So let us go on to another question. So... This is sort of just put in there for fun. This would not necessarily be on the exam. I just like this particular little factoid, little factoid. 
a little factoid. The drug revolution. It's kind of a lot of reading, so we'll go ahead and that's why it's 45 seconds long. So, all right, let's see. Do we get it? Do we know what the drug revolution refers to? Oh, yeah. So this is really interesting. We talk a lot about Colombian exchange crops, right, all the time. But one of the things about the Colombian exchange was it led to what some scholars call the drug revolution, which basically means that objects in their uh, cultural context, right, like coffee in the Amer co chocolate in the Americas and coffee in Ethiopia, have very, very particular contexts, like they're there and they're used in very particular rituals and only used by certain groups for certain reasons, right? Whereas uh, entrepreneurs and businessmen, they saw these, uh, these, these uh, food consumables and they said, oh, we could market that. We could take some of that, take some of that good caffeine, that good sugar, we can market that. We can sell that, make some money off that. So that's what's sometimes referred to as the drug revolution. That is the taking of these things like chocolate and coffee out of their ritual and cultural context and then just selling them on the market. So cultural appropriation is not a relatively new thing. It's as old as time itself. Coolio. All right, let's go. Almost done. Just a couple more questions and then we'll switch gears and do something else. So all the following are examples of resistance to military rule by Europeans except what except what which one of these is not an example of an indigenous people resisting military or resisting imperial rule this one's in the name uh feel like uh i feel like this one should be pretty obvious but let's see let's see what we got do we got it do we got it oh tell me we got it Yay! Yes, those who were playing, we got it. The Anglo-Dutch, the Anglo-Dutch War. So all of these are examples of indigenous peoples, or in the case of the Stono slave revolt slaves, uh, rising up against European rule, except for the Anglo-Dutch Wars. That's the one that I think was it Daegu Child mentioned earlier about um, fighting over spice, the spice trade, right? The English and the Dutch were fighting over those spice trade routes in Southeast Asia. So yeah. Oh, so this was the uh, this was the link that uh, Ragudeep sent to me. This uh, link that he sent me. This is from a project that he and a peer did uh, in class years ago. I'm gonna see if I can shift over. Let me pull up the. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Is that it? Nope. Is that it? Nope. Oops, hang on. I think it's got to be on my primary screen. Hang on. There we go. This is a project that was done by Raghudeep. And not this one. There we go. Oh, Kevin deleted the video. Wait, you guys made a video? I didn't even know you made a video. I forgot about that. But yeah, you guys made this really interesting website about... Uh, the different forms of resistance that uh, played a part in uh, the Americas during the climate exchange. Talked about the King Philip's War, right? Had a really lot of good graphics here. It's kind of awesome, right? After the war, and you had a nice uh, profile here on the Maroons, right? Nice description. Franco Macanal, Macandal, right? And you even talked about the first, first Maroon War, right? This is that... Uh, that uh, treaty they were talking about in the video, That's the. Uh, this is an artistic depiction of it. All right, and then you had a nice conclusion about, uh, you gave a nice answer to the question. So yeah, nice work. That was a real nice, uh, nice job you guys did. Oh, it was a voiceover, you guys did a voiceover. That's right, that's right, I forgot about that. That's cool though. That was real cool. Good stuff, all righty. Let's, uh, let's go. Let's keep it going. 
Alrighty, so in part as a response to increasing Dutch, Spanish, and Portuguese commercial presence in East Asia, Tokugawa Japan and Ming China did what? What did they do? What did they do? Did they grant continued trade concessions? Did they encourage local merchants to do business? Or did they gradually restrict the ability of foreigners to reside in their countries? I don't know. Let's find out. Oh, I think we're down to just one player. Oh, dang. That's all right. Let's find out. Could it be? Yeah. Restricting the ability, right? So it's not, uh, some people describe it as, uh, what you might call, uh, chi especially in China, when we talk about China in history, world history at this point, they talk about China like closing, like China's just going to close off, right? And then it'll kind of open back up when Europe comes again, then it'll close off again during the, uh, during the Communist Revolution. And then it'll open again under uh, Deng Xiaoping in the 1970s. So if you were to look at Chinese history through a Western lens, it's just open, close, open, close, open, close, like, like a revolving door because countries are definitely revolving doors. Okay. Uh, Raghudeep, why did AP World switch and start talking about so much modern stuff? That's a good question. I think I have, well, there's a couple reasons why. One was that it was genuinely just a really big class. It was a very large and sort of difficult to teach in a single year class. There's just so much stuff. And I don't think all of it was bad to get rid of some of it. Like a lot of the super ancient stuff, um, most teachers didn't spend a lot of time on anyways. Neither did we. Um, I think a lot of the, 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 the controversy and where it kind of got really heated was when they took out some stuff that was old but still relevant or when they removed certain items that decentered world history and recentered world history on what we would call a Western uh, narrative, right? So especially they were supposed to originally start at 1450. That would have been pretty crazy. Right, because then you would have eventually eliminated all of the pre-Columbian history, and that would have been kind of insane. If you remember that story, that famous TED Talk about the danger of a first story, that's kind of what a lot of people were, uh, were pushing for. Anyway, so real quick, the new legal social cultural system question mark in the Spanish colonies based on the concept of blood purity was the uh, casta system, the casta, not the caste, but that's where we get the word caste in English, but the casta, the casta. Uh, it did result in groups of people that were collectively known as mestizos or mixed people, right? That would be the children of Native Americans and European settlers. Um, but yeah, the casta system. Now I should note, I say question mark because I've recently learned that there's a lot of new scholarship that questions if this casta system was really even a thing necessarily, like how strictly legally enforced were all these things that we normally associate with it. So uh, still probably existed. I, I find it hard to believe that it didn't have sort of social consequences, but there's a big question mark as to how strictly enforced it was legally. So new scholarship all the time. Did the number of people getting fours and fives on the test change a lot after the switch? Well, it's actually really hard to say because the year after they, they made the switch, they did the full switch was the year of Corona. So it's hard to say for certain if the switch has had any, they haven't had a single normal test year after the switch. So it is hard to say what, uh, what's gonna, what had the bigger impact there. Awesome. So in terms of the kingdom of the Congo, the kingdom of the Congo, yeah. So there's the famous letter. You could, you might see it in a document on a question, right? There's a famous letter where the King of Congo writes to the King of Portugal and says, Hey, look, uh, your your traders, your merchants who live here on Lake Santo Tome, uh, they are really enthusiastic about slave trading. They're so enthusiastic about slave trading that they're taking all of our like they're just, just just grabbing everybody, right? They're just just grabbing everybody, right? They're climbing in your windows, snatching your people up, right? They're just they're doing all this bad stuff. So can you please keep your people under control? And the thing about that letter is that's usually the part that gets read, but then the the next part of the letter. The next part, the part that doesn't always get included, is that he says, like, look, if you want to buy slaves, just ask me, right? Just just go to my guys, and we'll get you some slaves. It's all good, but we want you to, to go through us, right? So the king of Congo, not so much to end the slave trade entirely, more as he just wanted to control it on his end. He wanted to be the supplier, whereas the Portuguese didn't want a supplier. They just wanted to go out and nab people, where the king of Congo was like, let me supply you. Let me be your dealer. Big difference in scores this year? It's hard to say. Yeah, we did read that document two years ago. 
it's uh it's hard to say what the score is going to be like this year i mean they haven't changed that much there wasn't like a super noticeable drop during um during the covid years so we will uh we'll see we'll see i think the transition back to in-person learning plus the fact that some schools are still not doing in-person learning um or they like they were started and they stopped and they started and they stopped it got really weird like my wife's school closed down for like two weeks because like half the eighth grade class got exposed it was bad so queen nizinga anna nizinga or nizinga of nadonga right she's famous for doing what well using her assistant as a footstool that's a pretty famous story but probably more famous for resisting the portuguese actually leading like her troops into battle into combat against the portuguese even into her if i'm remembering the story correctly even into her 60s or 70s she was still out there wielding a sword fighting uh, the good fight against her enemy so pretty darn cool all righty well <laughs> it seems like this one was a uh, a pretty foregone conclusion but let's congratulate the winners anyway just because we lost uh, lost a lot of people that's okay let's uh who we got so we got hickory uh, Mayorti, we got Hickory Mayorti, and we also got uh, Fudge, Fren Frankie Fudge, Frankie Fudge. So whomever the two of the, you were, just let me know, and we'll get you guys. Uh, we'll get you all some. Uh, we'll get you some stickers for that victory. We'll also celebrate by doing another. Uh, we'll pick another winner off of our. We'll pick another winner off our raffle. Let's see where's our. Uh, where to go? Where's my overlay? Oh, there it is. We'll pick another winner. Who could it be? Who could it be? Who could it be? Oh, it was Raghu Deep. Congrats. Congrats. Yeah, I know. <laughs> A lot of people dropped. Well, congrats. Uh, Kesu, just uh, come find me at some point. All righty. Let's uh, switch gears now. Now, we could do... Let's... There that. Oh. All right, so we could do one of a couple things now. So we got about, I don't know, 30-ish minutes left. Or not even 30, we got about 20 minutes left. And I suspect there are a ton of super, super engaged viewers right now. But what we could do is we could do some old-school multiple choice, like the kind you might see on your, uh, the kind you might see on your exam next week uh, based on some college board questions. Or <clears throat> if people really enjoyed that whole uh, game with the... Uh, with the the words and the pictures we could do that so we will uh we'll go ahead and do that let me just get a get a poll going real quick and people can pick do they want to do the vocab or do they want to do multiple choice we'll just do we'll just do that dope we'll get that going Dope. So one for vocab, two for MCQ. You have an MCQ for final? I don't know. It depends on your teacher. I don't give my students MCQs for finals, but uh, maybe your teacher does. I don't know. I do not know. It's all uh, all kind of up to them. Can you not vote? If you just type in the number, right? Isn't that how it works? Am I not, uh, did my overlay not work? Oh, there we go. Oh, dang, it's tied 50-50. We need a tiebreaker. We need a tiebreaker. Raghu Deep, help us out. Or somebody else. Jody Moon, Lumpy Bob, Mighty Man. Help us. Santa Claus. Oh, we got Santa Claus in the chat. What? Santa Claus? You didn't even compliment me on my hat. I'm like repping my Santa merch right now. Well, I guess I'm going to have to be the tiebreaker then. And I think since we did the vocab last time, we can do some uh, 
we'll do some actual multiple choice review this time. Oh, you notice the hat? Yeah, repping the, we're repping some Santa merch here, trying to keep in the season, a reason for the season, you know? Cool. Well, then let's go ahead and let's get some, uh, some multiple choice uh, cues going here. And this will be, uh, be pretty simple in the sense that uh, it will be uh, a little voting system like the one you see up there in the corner. You can vote for it. So uh, we're going to stick to our Unit 4 questions, though. So I'm going to scroll on down here. Just make sure we address a few that we haven't looked at already. Coolio. All right. Uh, let's pop on over here. Not that one. Here we go. Dope. All right. There we are. All right. So let me just get my. Yeah, I mean, obviously you can uh, you wear whatever you want. It's good to show a little spirit. All right. Let's get the the A B C D up there. So we got this lovely image of. Uh, a woman named Malinche. She was Cortez's translator during his conquest of the Aztecs and the Incas. These are two pictures of her, one of which is a Native American perspective of a story with her in it, the other of which is a Spanish perspective with her in it. So if you look at both of them, what, uh, what of the following consequences of colonial expansion can you see? In the period 1450 to 1750, is it A, the extension of regional trading networks and the consolidation of centralized power, is it B, the spread of new food and forms of religion? Is it C, the restructuring of the family and the growth of the plantation labor? Or is it D, the transfer of wealth to new elites and the development of new gender roles? What could it be? Is it A, B, C, or D? A, B, C, or D? You can just type in the chat, one, two, three, or four, A, B, C, or D. D. And I sincerely hope everyone can see it's coming through clean. We can uh, increase the size a little bit. If that helps. There we go. Oh, <laughs> need a couple, uh, couple choices there, a couple options. All good, yeah, nothing, no problem. Yeah, Malinche is interesting. Her legacy is rather controversial in modern Mexico because, I mean, on the one hand, you know, she is widely considered to be the mother, quote-unquote, the mother of Mexico because she was not only Cortez's translator, but she also was his, um, well, she bore him a son, right? And to what extent that relationship was consensual is a good question, but that son, that child between Cortez and Malinche, uh, is usually considered to be the first, <clears throat> the first Mexican, the first person of uh, mixed European and indigenous heritage. Probably not literally the first ever, but it's widely considered to be the first. On the other hand, she also contributed to the fall of the Aztec Empire um, and the rise of colonialism. So her, her legacy is incredibly mixed. So, consequences of colonial expansion. So we got two answers for A, but the answer is actually uh, the answer is actually uh, is actually D, right? The answer is actually D, right? And while it's true that you do see an extension of regional trading networks, right? Um, you don't necessarily see in this picture the consolidation of centralized power. Right, you do see goods being moved around, especially in the second image here, especially in the second image where you can see that. Um, if I lose my pointer, let me turn on the laser pointer really quick. This will help. There we go, laser pointer. Okay, especially in the second image right here, you can see that there are trade goods, right, being brought for tribute and negotiation. Right, but in particular, you see that Malinche's position is front and center in both of these. Uh, in both of these images, she's playing an incredibly important role uh, between Cortez and the Aztec elites, right? And that gender role is going to fundamentally change after the Spanish take control. That's a big part of the casta system is the uh, shifting roles for women, right? The restriction of women to a 
um, less public role. All right, so let's reset and let's go again with another question. So this one's gonna require a little bit of reading, so feel free to take a moment and uh, read through it. And I'm gonna reset the poll. And then I'll go ahead and get it started. We'll reset. So here we got another example of the Maroons, right? Those groups that we were talking about. Here we have an example of that treaty they were talking about. Oh, I see this, uh, the screen's a little bit out of the page. We gotta fix that. There we go. Gonna shrink that a little bit. There we go. Awesome, anyway, so this is that peace treaty that they were talking about in the video uh, of the Maroons and the British. And so this is obviously a slightly modified version of the peace treaty because the full peace treaty was really long but here are a, a couple of points from them. <clears throat> and the question here is specifically about Article 4, so it's this part right here. So we'll go ahead and take a minute to read it, and then when you're done, we'll go ahead and uh, you can just type 1, 2, 3, 4 for A, B, and C, and D, A, B, C, and D. All right, we got two votes. Got two votes. Both of which are for number D. Both of which are for D. Well, that is uh, that is not bad. However, there's if you look at uh, Article Four, right as what it desired for states to do. It doesn't seem to be, at least, you know, if you kind of look at it, it doesn't seem like it's talking about intermarriage at all, right? If anything, Article 4 is talking about um, uh, subjecting, uh, uh, helping to defeat other, um, other uh, uh, different groups of Maroons uh, on the island, right? So it's more about necessarily uh, something having to do with administration or violence, perhaps military control, right? So for example, um, a and C would be a slightly better uh, answer here. And C almost looks really good because they talk about paying, right? They shall pay to apprehend any runaway slaves and return them to their owners, right? And so that's why C looks good, but it's actually more A, right? Because this slaves in Jamaica were definitely, definitely not that minority population, right? You half the island's population is probably slaves. <gasps> oh my goodness, Yingy, what's good? So glad to stop by. So good to see you. So oh, good to see you. Are you doing any uh, games a little bit later on? So yeah, Dave, your child, uh, A would be the one. So number one would be the correct one. In a little bit, yeah. Well, I mean, we're, we're going to wrap up in about 10 minutes here. So maybe we'll just pop on over and uh, we'll check out what you're doing. But yeah, cool, cool. So, so glad you stopped by. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Is that a SpongeBob meme? Is that the little, the little yellow guy? Is that SpongeBob? Oops. Hmm. Oh, I apparently copied this question and did not put a second one in. Okay, my mistake. Just cram learning? Well, Dago Child, there's nothing wrong with that. Wait, do you have Dago Child, do you have A period tomorrow? Is that it? Oh, okay. Well, I think it'll be fine. So this is, I think we'll, we'll wrap up on this one. I think this is getting kind of late, but we'll wrap up on this one. So this is also kind of a, oh, Tuesday. Yeah, okay. So this is also a um, another uh, article, another document that talks about sort of this intermixed population in uh, European colonies. So this is a sermon that's a religious uh, statement, a religious message delivered by a Portuguese priest to plantation workers in the Bahia, Brazil. Bahia was for many years the center of sugar production, although uh, not as much as it used to be. But anyways, he gives this very particular presentation in which he's telling a story. 
And so the question is asking is, why is he telling this story, right? The fact that he's giving this story is seen as best evidence for which of the following. And uh, we'll go ahead and get that poll going again. And then you guys can answer that. The, oh, the December 17th TikTok thing, Casey, okay, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, it's really unfortunate that, like, social media, like, and this kind of goes back to that weird devious lick thing that was going on, like, four or five months, whenever that was happening. Everything blurs so much now, it's kind of sometimes hard to tell when things are happening. But, like, it's just, it is amazing how powerful, how powerful this social media can be to spread, um, to spread messages like that, right? So things like like Devious Lick, where just one like it was just one kid somewhere like, yo, check it out, I stole a bunch of face masks from school, and then you got people blowing up bathrooms, right? It's just kind of that's amazing to me, first of all. Um, yeah, and I think honestly, it, it probably it's a little bit of uh, releasing some of the cabin fever from a year and a half under lockdown, probably. And I also just genuinely think it's the fact that we live so much of our life online. Like, you know what, actually, you know what it really reminds me of? I'm thinking of a time, I read a book um, about, it was kind of a history of the internet, and the author made the case that we live in a virtual world now. And I have always thought when people talk about living in a, uh, an internet world or a virtual world, I've always thought that was a little uh, like weird to say, because very clearly we live in the real world, right? We're not, uh, we're not like living in cyberspace yet. But what he argued was that, we live in an internet world because everything we do, even in the real world, is just to get points and credibility and clout in the virtual world. And the virtual world is more important to us than the literal physical world. And that's the case he was making. Now, I don't know if I totally agree with that, but that made sense in a way that a lot of other, other arguments had not made sense to me before, right? Is that we, uh, we, we just, we're not literally living in cyberspace, but we are so... We do so much in the physical world for this. So like I spent probably half an hour, maybe an hour prepping like those quiz questions and, and you know, formatting this, right? And then we do, we're on this for 90 minutes. Then I'll probably spend like another half an hour, uh, you know, downloading and re-uploading to YouTube um, this particular video. So I mean, like this whole thing's about four hours of my day, give or take, right? So yeah, that's, that's the interesting thing. I think that's one of the things that TikTok makes me think about, right? Is that we do so much for the online world, right? But uh, yeah, I don't know if that fully answers your question, Keisu. I also just think it's really unfortunate that there's nothing really you can do about it um, because I, nobody wants to be the principal that said these kind of threats are a joke and they're fake. And then the, the one time you say that, it happens to be real. So I think it's, it's very hard because you don't want to be, you don't want to be that person and you can't be that person. That's why you have to take these all seriously, even when it feels like strange that these are always on days when there are exams or tests or something students don't want to do. And then suddenly there's a note found threatening violence. Like that is what it is. Anyways, sorry, so this sermon, sorry to get back on, to, uh, on track, this sermon, right, this story of the King Solomon, who's one of the most important figures in Judaism and Christianity, right, uh, had a, a queen or had a wife who was from what is now Ethiopia, uh, and then he had a, she had a child who went back and met King Solomon, right? So this sermon could be seen as evidence of which of the following, and the answer is yes, correct, it is B, right, the mixing of African and European cultures uh, in the Americas. Now, some people think it's A. Some people think it's A, right, new religions. But this isn't actually a new religion. I, I may be wrong, but I think the Queen of Sheba is actually mentioned in the Old Testament, just in passing. Not, um, not, um, I don't think she has, like, her own Bible in the Talmud, but she's definitely there, if I'm remembering correctly. I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that. I'm a little more, a bit, bit more of a New Testament guy than an Old Testament guy. Um, so yeah, but uh, yeah, the, the mixing of African and European cultures is can be seen by the fact that we're literally bringing in uh, a figure from Africa into one of the most important stories in Christianity and Judaism, right? Now what's really, what's really, really, really interesting to me about this particular sermon, right, is that 
Ethiopia, if you remember the map, Ethiopia is on the opposite side of Africa is where almost all the slaves from um, that, that went to Brazil came from what is now like Angola, Mozambique, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. They didn't come from Ethiopia. They came from those places. And so they were super far away, which is why it's really interesting that they would be telling this story, right? There must be a reason for that. So here's a second question, which is essentially why, why is he telling the story the way he's telling the story, right? So the question tells us here that this story is different from the uh, Hebrew version. That's the, the version that uh, uh, Jewish people might tell. And so if the question is different, right, why might that be? Right. And so I'm going to go ahead and we'll do, uh, we'll get this poll started. And you know, we'll, uh, we'll end the night on this one since we're pushing, we're pushing 90 minutes here. We'll, we'll go ahead and wrap it up here. And while we get this last answer, we'll go ahead and we'll get uh, one more. We'll get one more winner. Who could it be? It's Mighty Man. I don't even know. Is he still in the? Ch are they still in the chat? Is Mighty Man still here? Nah. Well, if anybody knows Mighty Man, just uh, let them know. Let them know they got some. Uh, they can pick up some stickers. They get some swag. Is he? I don't, I don't see him in chat. He pop back in. Oh, well, if, like I said, if it, maybe he'll reach out. I, I could try reaching out to him or her or whomever that is. Let's see. Will that work? Oh, yeah, I think I cancel tag him. Let's see. If I do that, will it summon summon them magically to appear? Appear in the chat. Mighty Man 14386. Appear. Woo. Anyways. Um. Coolio, coolio. So, uh, yeah, we're going to go ahead and we'll, we'll wrap this up, right? So why is it that this particular priest told the story the particular way he did, right? Even though it's different from the way the story is traditionally told. Well, um, do we have someone put one? Somebody answered one. Oh, no, somebody answered four, right? So in terms of why he did it, well, even though he was a Jesuit, um, there wasn't a ton of... Um, overt anti-Semitism within the Jesuits, or at least none that would influence storytelling quite like this, right? Um, was there more information about the event? Not particularly. There's no real reason to think that, right? Was he trying to encourage intermarriage between Brazilians of African and European descent? Um, perhaps, right? But is the marriage, right, to the Queen of Sheba and the uh, King Solomon, is that the key part of the story? Is that the crux of the story? I don't know. I mean, it's it's mentioned here, but it seems like most of the story is spent talking about the sun, right? And so that's why the answer here is actually B, right? He was uh, tailoring his sermon to appeal to those that he was speaking to, right? So this is what you call a cap statement or a hip statement, right? So you're talking about who is the intended audience of this particular sermon. Well, uh, these are his these are plantation workers, which, by the way, just out of curiosity, if we're talking about 1600s, if we're talking about Brazil. Plantation workers probably means what? If you're working on a sugar plantation in Brazil in the 1600s, you are probably a what? Most likely you are a... Yeah, you're probably a slave, right? It's It doesn't say that. Uh, and I think that's because there's another question attached to this. They don't want to give away the answer. But it's vi this is very likely sort of just a euphemism for slave. I mean, it could entirely be free labor, but it just be, would be incredibly unlikely. Um, and so therefore, uh, because this is going to be, there's a third question attached to this and they're trying to make it sound. They don't want to give it away. Right. So yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, it's almost 10 and I don't want to keep you guys up any longer than I have. So I want to thank everybody who came out and I will try to get this up and post it as soon as I can. You can also go, if you go to quiz, I believe you can, you can play, you can run through those quizzes again if you want to. I believe that I published them publicly so you can go run through them and if you want to watch the other replays they're just on the youtube channel um but yeah so i want to thank uh, everybody for coming out so that would be Dago child gg alex jody moon kesu lumpy bob 
Um, Santa Claus Gift, Sisa Soup, and Yingy, of course. Thank you so much for coming out. We really, I really appreciate it. Yeah, and uh, I think this will probably be the last review until we do have an Ask Me Anything that's coming up uh, on the 23rd. I finally got, uh, we finally reached a certain number of people in the Discord, and I said I would do an AMA. So we're going to do that. If you'd like to contribute to said AMA, you can pop into the Discord and drop a question that I'll uh, make sure I have up. But until then, I don't think I'm, I may not stream until then. So if I don't, I want to wish everyone really good luck with their exams. And if anyone, uh, if I won't see anybody else until after the new year, I wish everyone a happy new year and a happy uh, uh, holidays, whatever it is that you celebrate. So thank you so much, everybody. And I want to wish you all a really good night. Adios.